Hi, you guys. It's Ginger Cook with Story Time. Uh, as you know, Story Times are uh, uh, not uh, painting tutorials, even though we'll be doing an acrylic painting of an ocean from the coast of Canada. So uh, it's my life, the tree houses being a topic that came to mind when I was thinking about things. So we'll be talking about that. I'll be painting this painting, and if you're in the live chat, uh, if John's around, sometimes he looks at the monitor and sees if there's questions. Otherwise, we, you know, just hope you enjoy the experience of us painting this. Sounds good to me. Does that sound good to you, John? I'm more excited. Was a, that, was, that was pretty good, yeah? Absolutely. Okay. Just getting some colors here from my sky. Use up some of these old palettes. There we go. That looks like something we might want to want to play with there. That color and uh, something a little darker than that. So, I like painting oceans. People always ask me, what, what do you like to paint? And I think that one of the reasons that I like painting oceans is because I've spent a lot of time at the ocean. Uh, as a child, um, you know, we lived in Seattle, Washington, and it's, um, you know, we would go up for summer camp, San Juan Islands, see some beautiful coastal uh, areas. And uh, the summer camp was, you know, in the, the islands, now that it's a sound, so I guess people can say, well, it's not really an ocean, but it certainly is salt water. And um, uh, I would say that, it's salt water, and uh, you know, we did a lot of boating out there and canoeing and that kind of stuff. And then one, uh, I think I took my first cruise at, uh, through the pan from the west coast down through the Panama Canal into England. Oh gosh, when I was um, 13, going on 14. And so there was a lot of uh, time for me to um, uh, sit and stare at the ocean when we were cruising and, of course, when we went into port. So when somebody says, well, how do you know you like the ocean or what is it about the ocean that you like so much, I would say part of that is, is the fact that um, that I've had a lot of chance to be with it. And then, of course, mm. the water and the <laughs> ocean and our reference file is huge. Fungus. Huge. Bigger than big. Bigger than big, right? So, yeah, we... Oops, I just dropped that paint tube. I've got to get it for a second before I roll my chair over it. There we go. I always use these handy little clipper things. If you don't have those, those are just best. We should put those in our Amazon store thing. So I think everybody would enjoy those, don't you, John? Absolutely. You know, and whether you are 100 or not, you still might like the experience of those. That's kind of my feeling about it. Okay. So, and oceans are an, an interesting thing to paint and have absolutely nothing to do with tree houses. So the sort of conversations are going back and forth because yes, we're, um, I'm gonna to talk to you about tree houses, but um, I'm also gonna to talk to you about oceans and painting oceans. We, um, we found that um, people who haven't, you know, if you haven't really seen waves and water, it's hard to do it, just like it's hard to paint snow if you haven't, um, if you haven't experienced that, it's a little hard to sort of figure out. Um, you got to visualize it in your mind a little bit. I guess that what I would tell you is you got to visualize 
the, um, the, the, the picture in your mind and the waves. And if you've seen it, um, it helps. One of the reasons that our gnome challenge that we did through our Facebook club this year was so absolutely fabulously successful was um, because nobody had ever seen a gnome. She couldn't really paint it wrong. It's hard to find challenges like that where nobody can really be wrong because if you've never seen a gnome, how would you know? But for the people who see oceans, I remember the first time um, I saw a painting of an ocean. And it was the most complicated thing I had ever seen. I couldn't believe it. The patterns, you know, because you're talking really about patterns here, the patterns were extraordinary. And I mean, I couldn't believe um, the detail and the patterns that, it, that, that uh, it took place when painting an ocean. I mean, I just, I really, boy, I've just, I was dumbfounded. And I think that's because um, when all the little waves get going and you're looking at a whole expanse and you're looking at a painting on that, you're just, you're thinking, how did they put all that in and how did they see the patterns? How are these patterns, how are these patterns being recognized as a pattern? What is it that makes this a, a pattern piece? How, 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 do we, how do we see this? And, uh, and then one day I sort of broke it down and I realized that what I was looking at were little tiny triangles or like pyramid shapes. Lots of them, but that's what they were, little pyramid shapes. And once I saw the pyramid shapes, you just couldn't unsee them. Make sense? Once I saw these, I really couldn't unsee the pyramid shapes. Um, and then it made it much easier. So it was either like a paper towel roll coming into shore, or it's like a little pyramid shape of some kind. So once you've broken the ocean down into that, yeah. Then it's not. Then the complication of it isn't isn't so um, stark. I guess you just you're going. Okay, I get it. Pyramids. I think I could paint that. And so when when you're looking at when you're looking at any kind of painting, if you can break down <coughs> if you can break down the shapes. <coughs> into what it is. Break it down. Just like, for instance, when you do math, you don't divide 500 and 634,000 into 10 million, 600 and whatever it is, right? You break it down. They teach you that in school, to break it down. And you have to break down. If you got nothing out of what, listening to this story time, then you're getting that piece of so, solid advice. Break down the shapes, OK? Do that, break them down. Because if you can do that, then you've got a home run going here. So I'm gonna go ahead and dry. You're gonna find the hair dryer drying in there. We don't mute it during story time because it's like being in my studio and I apologize for that, but I have to dry as I go or I don't have much of a painting. Thank you. We absolutely needed to do that. So, um, though, I, and, and John and I love cruising, so I could say that we like oceans and we like cruising. I'm not such a big fan of. Um, just out there swimming in it, though Cinema's father was raised in uh, Wyoming and he felt he'd been gypped. Isn't that funny how we, we are with kids, you know, he was out in Wyoming, it's gorgeous, but he thought that he just, you know, needed to live um, someplace else. And I, and I realized that what's happened to us is that both he and I grew up in a society where there was television 
he was 10 years older than me, so he didn't see it that much, but he got the idea that when the television happened, like there were shows like American Bandstand and these different shows and TV shows. And he, 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 uh, somehow he felt like he'd missed out on something. And I know that when I was living in Seattle, I grew up in Seattle, and every Saturday, the first thing we did was we would, were the cartoons, and then a little bit after that, there were some cartoons, and then there was some, uh, uh, the, like Hopalong Cassidy and the, the, Lone, the Lone Ranger and all that stuff, right? They're those guys. And, you know, when, I, when we used to, you know, play, play those games of pretending like we were the Lone Ranger or Hopalong Cassidy, we would, you know, kind of act those out. And, you know, Seattle is very green. It's, it's, uh, it rains a ton, and it's green because of it. Yeah, just very green place, and um, uh, and I know that that sounds very spoiled, but I really did feel gypped somehow that um, that we grew up in Seattle, and it didn't look like well, I guess the Palm Desert or something, and my mother kept going on about uh, you could on a clear day you could see Mount Rainier and. There was, we had a view of the lake from where we were. We were way up high, miles away, but we could see Lake Washington. And, you know, all the reasons that she thought the place was great, it didn't look like what I saw on television. Does that make sense? It, didn't, it just didn't look like that. So, I, I, true story. I just, you know, eh. years later, going back to Seattle as an adult, and looking around at Puget Sound, and it's 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 heaven on earth that place. I can see why my mother loved it, but I didn't growing up. That's not just enough to say that I didn't. I did not love it at all. And so, let's see. I'm going to have some zinc white out there, or I'm painting. But I had a pony, and we would uh, we would uh, you know pretend like to be the good guys or the Indians or the, the the cowboys or the robbers or the bank. And my mom would uh, give us a sack of mail, and we pretend to be the Pony Express. And I mean, we we did not lack imagination, friends. We lacked none. But it does, it's sort of an interesting thing now that it's gone so much further since when I was a kid and John was a kid, maybe when you were a kid, was that the influence of social media and television is huge. And I don't think my parents were anywhere near prepared for how influenced we are by that. And movies, you saw it in the movies. People doing commercials absolutely knew we were influenced. We talked about this the other night on our live show about people wanting to be the Marlboro Man or having a Miller time. Or, uh, though I have to say that years later, like many years later, um, if you remember my story of the, append of the appendicitis, right? Well, after I got back from the hospital, after spending literally two months in the hospital, uh, my husband at the time, George, decided he, he needed a break from all of this, though I'm not sure why he thought he deserved one. And he went <laughs> off on a cruise we'd paid for, and he went off cruising. And it was an Atkins cruise, and um, Mr. Atkins was on it. You remember Atkins was the guy that was the, you know, all protein kind of guy? Um, and, you know, if you ate like that, you'd, you'd be healthy. And he had convinced the cruise ship to be um, to, to, to serve his special food in the dining room for everybody had a special menu. And uh, it was kind of neat, really. Uh, the, I didn't go on it, but apparently, according to George, it was neat. But what was funny, was, the funny story about that to me was that uh, 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 the, 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 there was a, um, 
a guy on the ship that was in charge of Atkins, you know, he was like the concierge for uh, Atkins um, program, okay? He was the one that, you know, that you went through. And I had, it turned out that he was one of the original Marlboro men, okay? And he told my friends that um, the um, Marlboro men, all of them had died of cancer, lung cancer. They died. Um, and, of course, he was an actor, and you know. But you, you just imagine something different. I'm sorry, you just imagine something different for people, you know. You think, oh, they're on TV. That must be wonderful. Um, I had always wanted to be um, somebody like Bob Ross. I'd always wanted to do that when I saw him teach painting, and I thought that was so great. And, you know, he never really made any money selling those. It was very tragic, and his son, uh, who paints, never inherited the story. Cinnamon tells that story. She could tell you sometime about that. I don't, uh, you know, but it just, sometimes there's not happy outcomes for people. Um, you like to see happy outcomes. Um, I think that's, you know, we like these happy, you know, I like movies with happy outcomes. You betcha. You want to see it. I'm going to dry one more time, you guys. I, th I think that the reason I don't enjoy biographies, I know people love re reading biographies, I don't enjoy them. Because you can't get, if I read fiction, I can pretty much guarantee some sort of happy outcome. You know what I mean? I can. But if I reading, uh, if I'm reading a, um, uh, a biography of somebody, anything could happen to that person. And I, really, some of them are quite distressing. You agree with me, John, on that? You know what I'm saying? Well, absolutely. You you just you really do want happy outcomes for people. You always want that. And um, and particularly, for instance, like for instance, even like Princess Diana. Um, I couldn't believe. Again, I guess this that would work, and it doesn't. Try a smaller one. I couldn't believe. You know that you know what, what happened to her when you when you listen to the story about what happened to her and you saw it because we saw it on the news, and I think people were feeling like, wait a minute, she's a princess. That does not happen to princesses. Not lovely people like that. Nothing bad ever happens to them. And she, you know, and, and you, it's distressed. And then you, you know, hear more about her life and you go, but that's not how, that's not how the story goes. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's why. Um, I religiously avoid biographies for the most part, unless somebody can tell me it had a, had a pretty good outcome. I mean, even Steve Jobs um, used to pretend, to get himself up in the morning, he used to pretend that he had cancer and he had a few days left to get everything done. I don't know, it's just not a nice, I don't want to go through life like that, pretending disasters before they happen. I don't think that's um, if you have any sense that you create your own reality, then you really don't want to do that. But even if you don't believe that, um, uh, uh, life experience tells you to um, just let, let sleeping dogs lie. Don't don't borrow trouble. You know what I mean? That that's I would say that's the big thing here. Don't borrow trouble. Yes. So that's, in, in growing up, I didn't have to borrow trouble. There was enough of it just on a daily basis for me. It seemed like there was always something that was happening in our world as far as that, even though, you know, being the daughter of a judge, and you adopt a daughter, a judge, you would think that um, that, that wouldn't be the case. But... Um, 
uh, it seems like there were always things that uh, could have been better. And probably for most people, they think back. John had this ideal childhood where he thought that, you know, except for his mother passing when he was younger, that really everything else was kind of peachy, wasn't it, John? Absolutely. You know, he had this sort of peachy, every, kind of Ozzy and Harriet uh, reality. Now, the other thing I want to mention, too, when I talk about this is that Ozzy and Harriet had a big influence on people because if your life or your marriage wasn't like that, then somehow you were a failure, not realizing those offset those people fought like cats and dogs. Okay? Um, they did. And uh, it's just interesting to me that, because you you, nobody really knows what's going on in real life. So when I tell you these stories, it is a little bit, you can see I'm still with it, so maybe it's not too scary to listen to them. Somehow I made it through all whatever I'm going to tell you, okay? So it can't be that bad, okay? And it wasn't, you know. And I did, was fortunate enough to be able to go to, a, you know, very famous summer camps and very expensive private boarding schools, um, if you like the idea of boarding and so forth. And, um, you know, and see the ocean. How's that? And see the ocean. So, uh, let's see, we're going to go back over here with this and this. As I sit here and paint my sky, when I was a kid, we had a swing that Dent, my, the judge made for me, and it was on an old apple tree. And it was just a board, you know, two ropes, and up there into the tree. And, and I would go out there and I would swing at least an hour and I would look at clouds and I would try to move them with my mind. I'd find shapes in the clouds and I had great joy in trying to move these things. Really. It was fun. Sometimes you think you, sometimes you almost imagine you did move them, you know? So anyway, um, we lived in, in what, Bellevue, Washington. When we moved out there when I was uh, just uh, probably six, turned six. And uh, my parents, uh, Dutch and Punky, had uh, 10 acres. That called, they had the lower five, which they returned to it as the lower five. And then they had, um, you know, the part that they dad mowed. And, um, It was a nice piece of property. It was uh, kind of hilly. Um, we had an old barn, not like a traditional barn, kind of flat roof barn, uh, with a couple, about three horse stalls and a place for hay. And it, that came probably, they didn't build that special, that came on the property, all right? And so my dad, and I always referred to him as my dad, even though. Um, he technically, legally never adopted me until I was uh, in my uh, teens. No, 20, I turned 21 is when he did it, okay? Uh, my dad um, was a really nice guy. He really was. He was a lovely person. It, it, the only thing you could really fault him for was not protect me, protecting me from... Uh, Punky, his wife, or my mother, when she went out in her rages. But, you know, other than, you know, I, I remember him saying things like, if you're going to abuse these children, I'm going to leave the room. <laughs> you know, gee, thanks. Right? And, but I mean, honestly, and it's, well, but for the years that I ended up going to private school in Seattle, we, they had a public school I went to for a while, and then we had a private school that um, I, I, I went to in uh, Seattle, it was called Helen Bush, and um, went down there, I think it was in the full fifth grade, maybe, yeah. And uh, sometimes I, I, if I missed the bus or something, or he was going into work early, he would, um, He'd give me a ride, and I'd ride. I'd ride into the um, 
in, into the um, city with him. And we discussed discuss court cases and who should get what. Because in those days, you know, it must be tired to hear old people talk, talking about in those days. But there wasn't such a thing as in those days. You know what I mean, John? Absolutely. There was an old, it was in those days, man. In those days, he had a lot of divorce cases and occasionally some robberies, but nothing like the crime that's going on now. There was just none of that. Okay? They handled a lot of divorce cases, and he was a superior court judge. And uh, so you think about, um, say, the cases that you know judges get now. It was nothing like that for him. Uh, and he liked being a judge. And he always told people he was a judge. Whenever we'd go out to uh, dinner, he'd, he'd shake the hand of the waiter, whoever was waiting on us, and say things like, Hello, I'm Judge Wilkins. Are you going to be my waiter today? Are you going to be my guy? Are you going to be my man? That was it. He always wanted somebody to be his man. Um, and I don't say that in a disparaging way. He's very sincere about that, right? You're going to be my guy. And, uh, and he was always nice to the waiters, and he'd ask them about themselves. How, where are you from? How do you have kids? What's your name? He, he had those waiters so fond of him that he tipped well. But, but the thing that he learned to do was that thing that he did was he turned them, the waiters that waited on him, they were people. They weren't waiters. They were people with lives. And he remembered them. So once he, once he um, knew somebody, he knew them. He didn't forget their names. And if he'd come back and he had seen some in a while, and they'd go, hey, Judge Wilkins, how you doing? He'd go, hi, Tony, how are you? That kind of stuff, right? I mean, that's a rare quality in a person. I think if you talk about uh, there's some lessons you learned. You know, you learn the most um, from your parents, not by what they say, but how, what they do. Actions. Their actions. And um, his, his actions were really that of a, a, a very nice person. And he had a, he just was a nice person. And didn't have to pretend to be a nice person. Um, now, it's interesting to note that my adopted mother was the most popular girl in her high school, according to her. I don't know if that's true. She said she was. And she used to say things like, love is how another person makes you feel about yourself. And, and then she wondered why we had trouble loving her because she always made us feel terrible about ourselves. <laughs> Just, you know, as, as much as she wanted that to be uh, true, and I'm not saying it's not, um, uh, it was in interesting because she was the kind of person that always found some sort of criticism and uh, espouted on it, you know, even after we were adults. You know, have you ever ironed a shirt in your life? This kind of stuff. You know, there was un in your life, have you ever in your life done this? Well, you know, I'm 10, probably not, but why? What are you thinking? <laughs> just, just. Of my favorite ones, have you ever flopped a pillow in your life? Um, I don't know. That was just, that was just her. That was just her. So, uh, then she can be really nice, too. So, you know, the problem with living with some people, when you live with a Jekyll Hyde person, you're hopeful. You're thinking, oh, this is the day they've changed. This is the day that they've suddenly had an epiphany and God loves them and they're going to be nice. I don't know what the epiphany I was hoping for. I never quite managed to figure, never quite managed to, to achieve that. But one, one lived in hope of this epiphany that never happened. Okay. Probably spending too long on these clouds, but I like them. I like doing the clouds. 
So uh, the first year we were, the, they had adopted us, right? All the, a lot of us kids, they took us in. They sent us off to summer camp. And my brothers went to a camp called Henderson's. And my sister and I went to a camp called Four Winds. We may have talked about this. And um, Four Winds was an enchanted place. It's uh, one of my favorite things it had was a, um, it, it had an old boat that they had turned into a playhouse and put it up on um, blocks. And it was a puppet theater. And you could put puppet shows on in there and pretend like you were out in the water. There was a steering wheel and it was painted like a, it was painted beautifully like a gypsy wagon. And um, you could, it was a, like a, just the neatest playhouse ever, right? And they had, um, and they had a, a, a big giant tree in front of where you ate, in front of the lodge where you, where you ate. And this, it was, they had a tree house going up into the tree that was easily, it was three stories. And, you know, four or five people could be up on each story. And, you know, it, it probably was, I was probably at the camp for, I don't know, maybe a couple summers before I ever felt courage enough to climb the top of that tree house. Because it was, it was just high, man. <laughs> it was just high. But if you were particularly, um, you know, at the camp, camp, your group of six girls in your camp, six or you know, probably six kids in your cabin, had done something particularly outstanding to the that the staff deemed outstanding, and it didn't happen to every to every camper in every summer. You could have tea in the treehouse. It was cool. English cookies. They'd bring it up there. I kid you not, man. That was big time stuff. Yeah. And uh, so uh, th that was this tree house and the cookies and this fancy tea. That was just great, man. We did that one time, and then the other time that they had a they had an old witch's cauldron out back along the coast with a. Uh, trails were along the edge where the where the there was this cliff and where the then there was beach and then there was water and they had this old witch's cauldron it just mostly sat empty but again if some camper had done something particularly outstanding uh, that you, your cabin could be in charge of making donuts for everybody and you would They'd fill it up with hot oil because you imagine how expensive that was, and uh, and you could have uh, you could have you could make these donuts. And you know, when you're a kid, you don't even imagine how donuts are made. Really, you just somebody gives you a donut, you don't really think about it. So you know, just to be able to make it, and, you know, they were lucky; nobody got hurt. Honestly, not to put a bad spin on it, but. I think this one is kind of hardened up on me, John. It's like little bricks out here, this stay wet palette. What's wrong with the stay wet palette? It's, it's like the colors are like little bricks, They're hardened over. It's been a while. Yeah, so anyway, I'll use the pads. paint I can. Pads. Huh? We have more palettes. We do, we have more palettes. I'll probably go grab another one. So, um, That was the, um, you know, those were some just, you know, talk about um, some fond, fond memories of camp. Those were some of my fondest were those. Um, just, you know, some of the things that they did. And they did, and then going to summer camp, except be, really being lonely, they had a big season and a little season. 
And big season was six weeks, and little season was two weeks. And um, most of the kids' parents brought them home for um, uh, after six weeks, and we stayed till the very last dying hour. And so by the time all your friends went home and you were still stuck there, camp, um, camp had lost a little of its charm, maybe, I guess. And, and you have to understand that when we were up there the first time, we were just getting to know these people that were going to be our parents. So uh, kind of getting dumped off and saying, see you later was, <laughs> wow, right? It's kind of a mean thing to do, too. But you know they didn't want us underfoot while they were remodeling. And, you know, camp sounded fun. Both of those, uh, my adopted mother had grown up on a farm in Yakima, Washington, working farm, cherry farm, and cattle. And so, and then my dad, you know, family had been, judge's family had been coal miners. His father was a coal miner, and his brother, uh, his, his brother, his oldest brother, there's like six kids, I think, his oldest brother, was um, 13 when he had to quit school. I think his, dad, his um, uh, father had died, and he was like 13 years old, and he had to quit school and go into those mines to work, the coal mines, to help support this family with all these kids. And it was so stressful for him uh, whatever, maybe afraid of the dark, or who knows what happens to young boys that are 13 in coal mines, uh, unattended, who knows, I'm not saying I know, but I'm just saying that whatever happened to him was so traumatic that uh, he killed himself rather than go back into the mines. And my father, his brother's name was William, my father you know, who later became a judge. I mean, their family was what they were Welsh. I guess there was mining in Wales when they were younger. When before before their dad came over, he had been a miner, so they knew coal mining. That's kind of what they knew. And Uh, so there really wasn't, there wasn't really a choice. So my dad got a job with a um, judge. He got a job with a local doctor going around town when he was 13 instead of, uh, that paid almost as well because he wasn't, if he wasn't going to go in, whatever his brother had told him, for sure he wasn't going to go into those coal mines. No matter what his mother said, he wasn't going to go. And, um, So then, uh, the World War I came along. And I don't know if he didn't think he could keep the coal mining job up that long or what, but, um, or, you know, could, could prevent going down in the coal mines or what. But he, he lied about his age and he joined the Army at, at, 13, at 14. Not 16, but 14, and you know, nobody thought to check, you know, they just said, fine, we'll take you, and uh, th there was a draft, and he went, I mean, you know, enough of a draft, but whatever, he went, and so, you know, talking about his experience in World War II for another time, um, summer camp with kids, horses, and boats, and you look at the brochure, that they didn't think they were being crummy. You know what I mean? I think for one minute thought they were being anything but kind. We're going to send you guys. We, we had been living trapped as prisoners, like the prisoners of Zelda, in this big house in Seattle run by governesses and never gone anywhere and got to do anything since our par parents had died. And I think, honestly think, that they thought that what they were doing was a kindness. Really. I think so. And, and it was kind of, you know, kind of, you know, 
It was, sort of. Um, and I say that because um, uh, in, in, you know, if I had a kid and I had an opportunity to send him to summer camp, I'd send him. Yes? I'd send him. Of course, you know, so I mean, I get why they, they sent us. In other words, I get why they sent us. But the problem is when you're a little kid, and you know, they again. It was the I was too um, young to go to that camp by a year, so um, all the all the other kids, uh, you know, uh, you know, when the, you're, when there's that big a discrepancy in age with kids, it makes a difference. And um, So I mean, there were some trials and traumas on that, but I have to say, in the old part, the thing that I, I you know, we went for many years to that camp and did things, and I, and I enjoyed that very much, really, honestly. It's hard, I know it's hard to believe, but I did. I enjoyed that, and however, um, it was an experience. Um, you know, one of the lessons, probably one of the lessons I learned, besides tree houses can be scary, uh, was that um, if you tell people your problems, you know, like, oh, I was adopted and all this stuff, you tell people that stuff, they might be your friend for an hour or two. But that doesn't, there's no payoff in telling anybody anything. You know, if you t look at the, you know, why people do stuff with a payoff, I suppose. What I mean by that is just, there's just, it, it doesn't make for friendships. It doesn't people make like you better, like you least. It's just something that happened to you. So, you know, when I tell you this, these stories, it is not to make you sad or feel bad about anything that happened in my life. It's an interesting, I think, in some ways. But I, I don't feel bad about it anymore, so please, you don't, OK? Make sense, John? Yes. Just, you know. And um, so as soon as I'm thinking about the colors we're going to be using here, Houses were, you know, even to this day, I would love a tree house. Okay, I just think they're great. And of course, nowadays, um, you would build a tree house differently than they did at Four Winds Camp or the one I tried to build when I was a kid. Nowadays, you, if you're going to build it, you consult with an arborist. Those are people that, um, that's an actual job, an arborist. Those are people that actually decide um, the health of the tree. And what you shouldn't 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 do to the tree. Interesting, huh? I mean, who knew, right? It's a true sign of a tree hugger. Yeah, you, you know, there's um, there's art, yeah, there's like real arborist people. And. Let's see, I think I'm going to switch palettes for a minute, see what I got on this one. Uh, nope, not that one. I feel like Goldilocks and the three bears here. What did you put over here, John? Oh, that's one I didn't want. What was the? I need something that looks like this. You want that? No. That was this one. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. So I've got to put, put that up here. Put some green out. So when we got back from summer camp, one of the first things we did was tell our 
new parents about the neat tree house. There was a tree house and everything, right? And, and you know, and then I had, my sister didn't really have any friends in our neighborhood growing up, but I had two, two cousins that were, that, you know, that I interacted with all the time. And, uh, uh, and one of them, see, my, the judge didn't, I don't think he owned a saw. If he did, he wasn't, he didn't grow up being mechanical at all, okay? But, um, oh, I dropped my rag here, so let me find it. But my friend Tina, Tina, her dad had tools and stuff, and we had some wood piled back by the barn, down behind the barn, some planks and stuff, and she knew how to use a saw. So we, the, the, her and Tina and Emily and my sister and I decided to build a tree house. We had the perfect tree down at the lower five. It was a big cherry tree, really good cherries that came off of that. And we decided to build a tree house. And surprisingly, um, unsupervised. You know, it was just have fun kids go play kind of. It was really a lot of the have fun kids go play thing, right? Um, I know, it just sounds very irresponsible, doesn't it? But there was a lot of that. And uh, so um, we, we got, we, we, you know, we figured out we could cut some boards and we got some nails and we nailed in the stuff. And I'm telling you what, it was big time fun, you know? Well, yeah, big time fun. And, um, and it went better that the year before my sister and I had gotten brand new mattresses and they came in big for twin, twin mattresses and they came in big boxes and we had a little tiny pond about the size of a well it was a pond is too nice a word for what this was okay but it was a pond and and we tried to go sailing out on the pond in your, in your cardboard boat in our cardboard each of us got in our boats and got some wood paddles, you know, kind of piece of sticks to paddle in. How'd that go? Well, they just sunk is what they did out there. <laughs> <laughs> just sunk, right? So on to the next adventure. But we weren't anything if not wanting to try stuff, right? So then we... Uh, so the next year we thought we'd do this, you know, with the help of my good friend Tina... And, and Emily, and Tina, who was really new things. And don't you have to, you have friends like that occasionally, the ones that kind of, oh yeah, I know how to do that, let's do that, one of those. So we, we did it with her. And uh, uh, gosh, we, we, got, we got the first story and then we got, well, we could go up a story. We got one story up there with plank floor and everything, right? And then we thought, well, we'll go on up and, and build a, we'll, we'll go ahead and build the next story, which we did because, you know, remember we had this, I mean, it was like the Taj Mahal in, in a shack is the difference between the treehouse at camp and the one we were doing, but still, nonetheless, you know, as kids, you just, you're full of hope, right? Always. <laughs> so we, um, we, we, we soldiered on here with that. And, uh, and built the next, next level. And then we had the bright idea that what we were going to do, what, what good was a tree house? if you couldn't um, sleep in it. Really, I mean, think about it, right? Anybody, anybody could see that, right? It makes sense to me. So we decided to spend the night in the treehouse. And somehow, um, our parents all agreed to this. But, you know, the judge was, look, it wasn't so much my mother, but the judge was a nice guy and he, did things in the neighborhood for people, and they liked him. 
And um, nobody wanted to be on the bad side of him, I don't think. So uh, anyhow, uh, we spent, you know, we climbed up there with our sleeping bags and we, uh, and we spent the night. In the treehouse? The treehouse. That's so cool. And then my sister ruined it for us because somehow she managed to do something. A couple boards broke, one of the railings, I think, and she fell out and broke her arm. Ow. And of course, the treehouse had to come down. That was it, man. No more treehouse. We let you do it. And I'm sorry, you obviously couldn't build anything worthwhile. Now, the dust could have helped us, you know what I mean? And maybe that, um, maybe that branch wouldn't have come down, right? Right? Yeah. Could have helped us, right? Could have, could have, could have, yes? Probably should have been at least advisors. Um, there were no advisors. Tina was the only one that knew anything about treehouses because she knew something about tools, not because she knew the first thing about tree houses, but she did know how to make a saw work. We all got to play with the saw, that was fun. You know, you just, you know, when you think about girls and, and what, in those days, what girls were allowed to learn to do and what boys did, right? Totally different deal, right? In fact, when I took a shop in a high school, junior high, I was the first girl ever to do it. They, they said I could, so I did, okay? But, um, uh, yeah, no. Not something girls did, just wasn't. So, anyhow, that was, our, that was disappointing, you know what I mean, you guys? I'm going to bring this a little bit closer. Okay, let me see what I've got going here with that. So treehouse days, right? We never had another treehouse. Um, when we lived in the, when I lived in my property in, in San Diego, we had to plant all the trees. There weren't any trees particularly. There just weren't any. So we all the tree planting was us. All right. Okay. So far so good, yes? All right, what about Manathus? About 30 minutes? Um, it's really closer to 53. I've got to stand up. Okay. I'm finding if I sit for more than two hours, I can't get up again. I don't know what's going on, but you know, I've got to stand up, you guys. I say right. go for it. Yeah. Take a breather. Oh, maybe you'd like to show them some of the wave and water pictures I brought out. Talk about the wave and water class. John? What wave and water? You know, we have a wave and water. You know, people want to know about well, painting water in the academy. Here's a couple of pictures. Oh, I didn't know you brought anything up. Well, of course I did. <clears throat> oh, the polar bears, those are good ones. You have it really hot in here. I'm going to turn the heat down. Already did. Did you? Yep. I'm almost tempted to open a window. It is hot. Well, you know, that, that happens. Get this out of the way so I don't ruin that masterpiece. As many of you may know, we have a Wave and Water Masterclass, which is, um, deals with water. Oceans, rivers, lakes. If it has water, it's in that class. It's a focus on how to paint water, all the different ways to play with water. This was one of our, this was one of our earlier ones. Yeah. Rock formations. And we have the polar bear one, this is a great one. 
That was Alaska, the rock formation. That was from our trip to Alaska. No, this was down in Australia. Yeah, we did that in Australia, but still, <laughs> I mean, you want to learn how to paint water. Right. These guys, this was uh, polar bears. This was an ODG, wasn't it? Um, no. No? No. Hmm. What, the polar bears was an ODG? Yes, it was an ODG. That's what I thought. Yeah. Let's explain what that is for people. ODG is a the old dead guys. Yeah, artists before 1900. Artists before 19. Well, you're talking. You're on the well, they're, I'm still on. Yeah, they're artists yeah. before. I just have to stand. They're artists before 1900. Okay. Artists before us. Yeah. So we've done a lot of those on our website because you can learn so much with them. And that polar bear painting is timeless. We've got some great. Great waters, you know, from beginner to advanced wave and water. So uh, if you're a purple member, you have access to that, or you can sign up exclusively for our wave and water program on our academy, paintingwithginger.com. This is one we did in, Ginger did in Australia. That's going to tent. That's hers. So all kinds of waves and waters. So, and that's, you know, it's not that you have to be a master to paint it, but we feel like if you do enough of them, you, you will become get, a you master. Will get good at it. We don't expect you to be a master to take the class, but honestly, if you ever wanted to learn how to paint water, then we strongly suggest that or, you know, take advantage of, of our uh, membership discounts. If you're a red member, you want to paint a water painting, you can... Uh, you get a discount for buying the downloadable, right? Where do I get paint? Every time I come in your area. You got paint on yourself, John? All right. Pretty blue. All right, I have to, sorry, but I had to take, you could well appreciate it. I just had to, I have to stand up every hour. I don't know what's going on, but if I don't stand up you don't every hour, up. then I'm just, uh, I struggle to stand up. I've had some shots in my knees, but, you know, there's always something, right? But uh, seems like we, whoops, I didn't want all that. Let's see, I'm a different brush. Where's that cast, is that tongue? brush. Didn't get... Uh, let's just try this one. Sometimes you can take a little zinc white. So before we were talking, what are we talking? We we're talking about tree houses and parenting. So Cinnamon never had a tree house and uh, I never had another one. But I might, uh, but there's a true story about, and, and I think there's something magical about tree houses. It's a story about a, uh, Oregon has some wonderful trees and, you know, old, old growth trees. And this man had some beautiful trees on his property and he built himself a tree house because why, why not, right? Why wouldn't you? All right. And uh, let's see, let's put some white paint out here. And anyway, so um, people said, oh my gosh, can I stay in your tree house? Yeah? And he goes, well, yeah, I guess so, huh? Um, and he says, we'll pay you. And so pretty soon he realized he had a pretty good business. He built another tree house, and then he connected it with a ramp and um, didn't have pl indoor plumbing, but any more than a campground does. But you had, um, you definitely had, um, you know, the experience of being in the trees and in this nifty tra camping out instead of a tent in a treehouse. And then the city of Portland came along, and somebody heard about it, and maybe it was a write-up in a newspaper. Who knows how these things get out these days, but it got out. And um, they explained to him that he, that he did not have a building permit to rent house. out treehouses, and that they hadn't been inspected, nor were they deemed so that the tree could fall down, anything. It didn't matter if the tree had been standing there for the last 100 years or two, um, he, um, it was explained to him 
very thoroughly that um, his uh, treehouse's adventure had to come to an end. And he had a lot invested in that man. And the people were disappointed. Of course, you would be too if you had had vacation and you told your kids, we're going to go to the neatest place and we're going to stay in this treehouse and it's going to be so cool. And then find out there's no treehouse because the city of Portland decided that um, it wasn't safe or whatever the reason was for not letting him have the treehouse. So what he did was he let you stay in the treehouse for free. But in order to do that, you had to buy a t-shirt for the cost of what it would have cost to rent the treehouse. Ooh. Yeah, huh? So yeah, you could stay in the treehouse for free. But. But, but there's the big, big but, right? Big but. Yeah. Big butt, but not uh, not so free. Anyway, so he kind of got around that, and someday I'd like to at least see him. You know, wouldn't you, kind of, John? Yeah, I think it's cool. I never had a treehouse. You didn't either. Nope. The idea of them's fun. Well, you know, you can see my parents, um, from a litigation standpoint, just imagine if it was one of the neighbor's kids that had fallen. Oh. Oh, and they yeah. decided that there was money there and sued. Yep. Because that's the kind of world we live in. Even back then, we lived in a world like that. Yeah. Absolutely. We did. So, anyway, that was our treehouse adventure. Any comments going on down there, John, that you notice on our mm, chat? I haven't really been watching it too much. Why don't you watch it a little bit? Just for a second, just kind of give us an idea. Uh, Jules has been doing a little digging in Ancestry.com and came across a Japanese maid. Was she ever involved in your life? No, we never, no. The, the interesting thing about the Japanese maid was my sister, or rather my daughter found out about her some years ago, like about 10 years ago when she did some genealogy. No one else ever found out. She never showed up in our life. Um, she was um, never involved. And I think it, you have to understand that, that my real father, uh, John von Herberg, uh, was uh, um, you know, a multimillionaire. And uh, when the census uh, and apparently it lacked real moral character from everything I've read about him, okay? And the, the, as the census goes, when the census people came around to um, talk about, uh, you know, how many people lived in the house, she was mentioned in the census as the, the daughter of the maid that he had, you know? I mean, you've got to be at a certain level of rich to be able to openly admit um, that you're, I mean, even Schwarzenegger couldn't, didn't really get away with it with the, with the, um, um, with the babysitters. So you imagine, um, uh, you know, the fact that my father was willing to admit that he and the, the made, made um, He'd had a dalliance with. Would that be the word? A little dalliance with the maid. Is that I? And uh, I mean, because nobody just you know, people didn't do stuff like that. I mean, if they did, they didn't talk about it, right? But he was one of those people that didn't care what anybody knew. You know it or you don't know it. He didn't care. 
And one of the reasons my mother, who was a world famous psychic, and we'll talk about her in another time, married her was because everybody she'd ever dated up until that point was ter she was such an accurate psychic, she was terif they were terrified of her. Thought that she'd find out their wrongdoings. Yeah, huh? Yeah. So, um, yeah, just, these are kind of weird things, kind of weird stories that happen, but um, uh, let's see, what have I got here? I'm looking for, I need a new tube of that violet color, that uh, purple from um, Holbein. I want, I want, I want. Yep, there I, you go. You caught it all. The mauve? Uh, yeah, that mauve, yeah. I don't think I have another mauve. You, know, you weren't supposed to be using as much as you've been using. Yeah. Well. Oh. Nope. We've got the dioxine. Lots of it. Nope. Oh, my God, it's Diox. Jules it? and I will have to talk on the phone sometime. She's doing all this genealogy, see what she came up with. All kinds of stuff. Can't wait. All I got is that. Want it or not? Uh, Nazi and violet. That might be interesting. <laughs> it's not purple, it's violet. See? Right. Well, you asked for mauve, which is close to violet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Where, where's the mauve at? It's, it's gone. It was gone yesterday or the day before or some other time. How far off is this one? I give up. How far off is it? This blue-violet, that's pretty. Let's try that. Blue-violet. Da, 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 da. See, we're going to become singers, a singing artist. Yeah. I'm telling you, we make a million. So anyway, yeah, the maid thing, huh? Yeah, the maid thing. That's the only purple they've got, Salvador. I guess that needs to go on the list. Yeah, we always have to have a list. Can, can you get the girls to make you, a, we talk about the girls, so those little people that you buy from Amazon in a, in a box, and if you say their name, they start talking for the rest of the afternoon, but they're very good <laughs> at keeping lists, right? Yes? Well, we have an art list in there. Do we have an art list? I believe so. Did you say? We're going to find out. No, John will ask. We'll know soon. Echo. Add a Holbein mauve to the art list. Holbein mauve added to Ginger's art. Ginger's art. See, she doesn't get added to the... Um, it's called Ginger's art or Ginger's art because of the way you said it to her. Okay. I'll have to fix that sometime. But yes, it's on there now. Okay. But, uh, you know, again, there's very few people that don't care what anybody knows. Most people really care what other people know, and he just didn't. And we'll have he was to talk me. about him. He was an entrepreneur, he didn't care. You know it or you don't know it, this was your problem. Yes and yes? I can see it that way. So, uh, anyhow. Let's see, I'm just talking about it. I made a little list of things. Let me just look and see. I've got so far away, I've got to put my glasses on. Just in. So, the years that, um, the t couple of years that I was in public school with, um, with my friends, Emily and Tina. We were all, we were luckily, we were all in the same grade, which was lovely for me. And um, uh, we were, you know, we, we would, uh, we, I don't remember if we had the same classes. It was a pretty big public school. But we definitely were all in the same grade. And so we, you know, we did Girl Scouts together. I think my mother hosted a, a Girl Scout um, 
thing in our house. We had we had that, uh, and uh, uh, in our in our rec room down there. And it, people don't call them rec rooms anymore. No, they did are you not have a rec, rec room, room, John? Yeah, you did. That was the time for it, right? rec room. And I remember being a smart ass and saying she was mad because it was all messy. I said, "Well, what if it's a rec room? Why can't we <laughs> wreck it?" <laughs> yes, that would be you. <laughs> really, it's a rec room. We should wreck it, you know. But apparently, no humor. For, you know, nobody has my sense of humor. Maybe some you of you do. Who is that? I don't know. I feel cheated somehow. I have a great sense of humor, and nobody seemed to enjoy it as much as me. Uh, so, um, yeah, back to my friends. And so, and I had the pony. And um, what was the pony's so I, name? It was Buster. Buster. And um, everybody would come over to my house and, and and play, and we'd, you know, play with the pony, and it was it was fun times, really, honestly, great fun times. And my sister had had a Palomino horse that she had brought with her back from uh, from camp the first year we went. I had Ranger and she had a horse named Cloud because he was a Palomino, white kind of horsey thing as I remember. And she just didn't have any interest in riding. I mean, we didn't have a lot of adult help. Does that make sense? So she didn't figure out soon enough so she, she could ride but she didn't care about you know having horses, so that when um, we got the pony, we got the pony from a guy named Jimmy Rainwater. He had a uh, a big uh, kind of barn and riding thing up, um, uh, you know, not near us by any means, but you know somewhere where it could be you know get access to it. And Senator uh, Kofoskin is undoing this wave now as I'm talking to you. Jimmy's, uh, anyway, Jimmy found us the pony. And so they brought the pony home. And I mean, I really, you know, the pony and I was, was a savior. The pony really was a savior for me. Because it was something that was really just mine. The dog was my mother's. The cats kept disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Unbeknownst to you. Yeah, you know, but the, but by the time I got the pony, I had my cat patches, which was not disappearing. And, um, and we still had the dog Lassie. And so we all were great friends. And my parents were, my mother was raised a Catholic, my adopted mother. And my dad is, was a, uh, Methodist, his family, and and so when the um, time came to do something about a religious education, the people that were high society were all Episcopalians. That's what you were, and you you know all of their friends were Episcopalians, and so when. Um, uh, they adopted us, you know, took us kids in, technically didn't adopt us, so they told their friends they had. Um, they set us up uh, going to this Episcopalian uh, uh, church, you know, down the road. And, you know, we all went for a while. And the problem is, is that, um, and by this time my parents had moved out of the house and they had taken their garage and they had ma made themselves a um, two bedroom, no it was one bedroom, but they were like um, 
like a library with like two hide-a-bed kind of things, like two twin beds against the wall, kind of singular file against the one wall. And there was a little kitchen over there. And um, they had um, created this um, little living space for them, um, which was different than the um, living space of my, my, my sister and I, okay? So they're, um, So if I was up in the main house, the, the, uh, the, the Swedish uh, babysitter maid, she slept upstairs, way up and didn't hear anybody. And so it was very easy to sneak out of the house, okay? You wouldn't do that, would because you? Because my sister was one of those people that liked to sleep in. And I was one of those people that got up at the crack of dawn thinking I'd miss something. I was a crack of the dawn, let's get up in the morning, do something. You know, and even as I got older as a teenager, I have no patience for my friends that could not get their butts out of bed and get on with life. They've just, they've slept in. I just never slept in at all, ever. And uh, so anyhow, the, um, So if I got up early enough, I could sneak out of the house and be off on my pony. And I, I didn't bother to get dressed. I put on jeans and my pajama top, because you had to be quick about these things. You heard rustling around too much, somebody might catch you. And then head down to the barn and grab the pony and truck out for none the wiser. Now, I did this all in, a, in a, a, a valiant effort to avoid going to church, which I found it t totally took up my day, man. You know? <laughs> Just, it did. Come on, let's, let's be real. You know, even if you love going to church, there's your Sunday. You know, it's blown, right? You're a busy and, gal. And when you're a kid and you've got two days off, you want to maximize it. You want to maximize it. Amp darn straight, John. You want to maximize it, okay? And um, I know that sounds just terrible, but that's, I'm just telling you how it was, okay? How I felt it was as a child growing up. That's how I foresaw the world, right? There was the... And um, my, friends, my friends were um, Christian scientists, so they, they didn't go to the same church. And um, they were the neighbors, but that, that, that's all that they were for my parents. They were just the neighbors. Just the neighbors. You know, the neighbors, and nice enough, but um, certainly nobody they'd invite to a party or anything, right? Um, they were the neighbors once we lived there. And, and they had some kids that, you know, we could, uh, you know, interact with, though my sister had nobody. Um, and she was three years older, and we didn't like the same things. And the only thing we really had in common was the Vogue dolls, and she had better stuff, and I always wanted her stuff, and you know how it is. So, um, anyhow. Uh, so my sister, you know, wasn't awake to catch me. And like I say, the other people were... Um, you know, my parents were, you know, had probably set the alarm for church, but you know what I mean? They weren't getting up before they had to. So if I got out of there, then um, no one would be the wiser. It's amazing how much of my life I spent just sneaking out of the house. You know, <laughs> just think about it later in my teenage years, sneaking out. Um, I started at a very did. early age doing that stuff, right? Ser seriously. Uh, and so, 
Okay, so I'm co concentrating on telling you the story. So anyway, I got the bright idea one day that just, you know what, this church stuff sucks, and I could, uh, and that, that's the day, right? And, um, and she, my mother also had this thing about good socks and bad socks. Did you have that? The good socks and the bad socks, and you couldn't wear the good socks um, out to play? Did you have that, John? Oh, yeah. Those are your good socks. Those are your Sunday socks. Yeah, Sunday school socks. And there was a, there's just another, there's just more stuff involved in church and socks. Honestly, honestly, you guys, it was just too much, right? It truly was. And so anyway, I got the pony. And then the first time I went out and I, thought I went over to, to Emily's house because she was real close. She just lived up the alley from me and be back across the road and up the back alley by Mr. Dyer's. And I was at her house. And they, they were um, just eating breakfast when I showed up. And I said, can Emily come out and play? And they said, no, this is Sunday. We go to, she was trapped. We go to church on Sunday. Or maybe they'd just gotten back. I think they'd just gotten back. But, you know, we're just having breakfast. Uh, is anybody up at your house? I said, oh, no. Have you had breakfast? No. Here I'm in my little stained pajama top and looking very forlorn, yes? <laughs> looking like the starving child that you are. Yeah, right. And uh, you can bet I raided the refrigerator before I ever stepped off on this journey, too, right? You know, we did have food in the house, right? So uh, they said, well, okay. Uh, Come on in and uh, you know have breakfast with us. So then I guess they had Emily had homework or she had to do something she couldn't play. So then I went up. I left them with the pony and and drove and then rode up to her her cousin's house, which was further away, not too far, about another fifteen minutes. And um, wanted to know the same question: Can Emily come and play? Apparently not. No, so Tina was Tina's tax house. No, she can't come. We're just, um, we just got back. They went to a different church service than their cousin. For some reason, they didn't go all go at the same time. I don't know if there's something to be said about that, but I don't know what it was at the time. So anyhow, the, um, the, uh, the push came to shove. Um, The, the, I had breakfast with them too. They had, I forget what they had. That was good. It was a different breakfast. Okay. And then again, it was the same story. Nobody could play. They all had things to do. So Tina couldn't, you know. So then I left them. And I had another friend who I kind of knew from school. We didn't know each other that well, but I'd been to her house a couple times. She lived in a real subdivision. And far, it was kind of far for me. You know, it was past my, you know, parents' cousin's house. It was far. And um, so then I went over there and, hi, can Margaret, you know, play for a little bit? No, but uh, we're just eating breakfast around noon by now. I've been up since 7. Um, you want to have some breakfast with us? Have you had breakfast? No, nobody's up at my house. Of course, that's a lie that I this time they were all probably wondering where I'd gone, right? <laughs> so some of you may have heard this story, but it's kind of I mean, it's just it's incredible to me that um, we had this kind of um, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but these kind of adventures with the. with the pony and stuff. And then the, the, the women all talked. And my mother, the thing that you couldn't do to my mother was um, embarrass, the, embarrass the neighbors. Mm -hmm. I mean, embarrass her for the neighbors, in front of the neighbors. You couldn't get embarrassed. And um, there was some doubt as to what kind of mother she was anyway. And then here that um, I was going around begging for food was just, <laughs> <laughs> just. She just, she was mad at the housekeeper. I think she got fired for not, not noticing I wasn't around, right? Know why that lady should have to get up at 6 in the morning, I don't know. 
and um, and th th they put a stop to it. Now it's interesting; they all didn't go to church. You know, I just want to say that they didn't all say, "Oh, we can't. We'll look for her, but we should go to church or something." They they, they weren't wanting to go to church, and then finally, when my sister could drive they had my sister and I go and they stayed home so I mean you can see how interested they were in this now keep in mind that um, when I went to that uh, that's private school in, in the fourth grade in any right seminary in um, uh, Tacoma Washington we had church uh, twice a day and once on, uh, three times on Sunday or once on Sunday. We had a lot of that. It was an Episcopal school, even though it was a high school for, for kids, but it was Episcopal school. And it was run by Episcopal nuns, or at least some of them were. And then my teacher, I don't know if she was a nun, but she was, might as well have been. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, it's, nothing was scarred by that, but it's just, it was interesting because my parents were, I think children figure out right away if you're, your parents are kind of speaking out of both sides of their mouth kind of thing, right? Same with them, they don't walk the talk or walk the, you know, live the talk. That was one of the reasons that um, I had such a problem with Thomas Kincaid. Uh, if you remember, he's the artist that he's passed away now, but he was the artist that sold um, uh, all his artwork, uh, you know, on, on the basis of being such a marvelous Christian and um, um, and, and, and his love for his wife Nancy, who he put her her initial in every painting to show how much he loved her, all the time living with his mistress. And nobody the wiser. In fact, when he died, he died at her, her house. Now, I don't care personally if he had a mistress or not. I only, the only reason I have a problem with it is because, um, because he used, you know, people, well, for instance, if there's a garage in town and there's a one guy and then there's another guy and their congregation and he's doing it, people will have a tendency to um, support that. Would you say that would be an accurate assessment, John? Yeah. yeah so this, so. Isn't, this isn't saying anything bad. So he, a lot of his artwork, which was beautiful, I love his artwork, you know, he not only didn't paint, painted some of it, but, um, uh, you know, he, he, he lied to people about how it came about, and that just bugged me. And I think maybe some of it stems back from the sort of the two-faced stuff I got. Then one thing that my parents actually were religious in the least way, because as I recall, after we grew up, they never the only time they ever set time in church again was to go to my wedding, which we got married there. And uh, she used to, the, I remember the, the pastor's name, his name is Father Val Spinoza. Isn't it funny how you can remember weird shit like that, John? Just weird stuff. And um, uh, 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 he would come by, and my parents would invite him over to play bingo. Um, that's the only time we ever played bingo. We never played after we weren't religious anymore. <laughs> Just. We, the, the, the fam, there was never such thing as a family bingo night after that. But you'd have thought that, um, that, you know, I mean, I don't know who we were trying to kid with this bingo night stuff that he was, they were doing. Hmm. Um, but we only did it when Father Val Spinoza was there. We never played it when, when he wasn't there, right? And then, maybe once or twice, but I really don't remember except for him. And then we had to let him win. Why? I never understood that either. We had to let him win. 
I don't agree with that rule. Oh, no. Well, when my mother played any games like that, too, we had to let her win, too. There were just certain people that had to win, or they, they, they were bad losers is what they were. And Colby remembers yourself. going to visit my, when we went up to get, to meet my parents, to talk about getting married, right, when I was 18. And the first time he met the judge, my, the judge's game was um, uh, dominoes. We did, we did play those. That was his game. And Colby remembers winning at dominoes and my dad saying, oh, let's have another game, let's have another game. And finally he had to throw a game so he'd let him go to bed. So, I mean, they, they had a funny relationships with... Uh, um, don't you think? With... Um, can you mute me for one second, please? Do what? I just like to be muted for one second. Uh, um. Come back. You're back. Look at that. When you do that for the drawing, aren't we considerate? Yeah, and he had to blow my nose. <laughs> Everybody thinks I'm sick. I'm not sick. I just got some allergies. I have to still put some zinc white out. Okay. So, anyhow. And, uh, interestingly, um, we, except for getting, you know, we did, I did get married at that church. But we, like I say, my parents never Never went back. I need to change brushes. Where are we getting that feedback from? What's that? We're getting feedback from somewhere now. Why is it always something? That's Sound, the bane of my existence. It's true. But as I talk, I'm sitting here thinking about the water and talking. Growing up in the growing up in the fifties and sixties. And I'm sure our kids will have their stories. And hmm. and everybody does. I mean everybody has these stories. I'm some kind of, some kind of story about what this is. It was interesting because, you know, we were uh, you know, raised by I think well meaning people. By what? I think the judge and punky were well meaning. Um 
but they're um, uh, oh, I don't know what you, how you'd say it, but they're but the, you know they had their own issues and they came through, which of course happens with everybody's parents have their own issues. Yes and yes. If that makes sense. And you know they would kind of come through. In the meantime, my brothers were not living with me, but were living in a um, house run by my Aunt Sally in, uh, in Seattle. And the judge would come by once a week and have dinner with them. They never saw Punky. I don't think she ever stopped by to say hello. It was interesting. Because, you know, as kids, you don't know what's normal and what's not. Do you say, would you say that that's true? Oh, I think that's true. You don't know if you just feel that that's how you live. Everybody lives like that. I had talked to this one lady one time, and she said growing up here in Texas, she really felt sorry for anybody that didn't. And I said, didn't what? Grow up in Texas? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. She's always felt sorry for it. And I think that, you know, as Americans, or whatever country you're from, you might think the same thing about where you're from. You, somebody didn't grow up, with, regardless of the country, that suddenly they um, missed the boat. Now, not obviously, there's a bunch of refugees somewhere off the border of Texas that didn't, don't agree. But, you know, for the most part, if you grew up in France or Germany or wherever, you probably um, might entertain the idea that you you grew up um, in the best place ever. And I remember thinking when, when Cinnamon and I went to to France and spent and spent a couple months, and we were looking at the appliances they had, and they had a they were. Um, so far advanced than what we had as far as um, you know the, the washing machines you could tell it how hot you wanted the water for instance that's fancy and they had stuff like that and you know quite frankly you know that that happened for us right I could I can tell my 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 hot washer machine now I want it to steam but we didn't have any of that right you know, they got it sooner, I guess. My friend's um, Goodrin, and she's from Germany, and her uh, her uh, let's get some weight on that. Her brother-in-law had a GPS phone way before anybody else. Eh, you know. So sometimes, you know, just, just because, you know, but for the most part, you just figure that's normal. And it wasn't until I went, like, for instance, I remember my friend Kathy next door, when we moved out to the country, Triple Creek Ranch, got out of um, um, Bellevue and moved out to there to Triple Creek. Um, my friend um, Kathy... Uh, play sick. Uh, I mean, her life was so different than mine. It was so di it's just so funny. And one of the things that you know, not growing up around my brothers, it was just my sister and I. And if anybody had chores to do, we really all we had to do was clean our clean our room. We didn't really have to do anything else. You know, I fed the pony and that kind of stuff, or our horses. But nobody had to do really particularly anything else. And. Um, Kathy had to, had to make the beds for everybody in the family, including her older brother, which I thought was just outrageous. I said, why can't he make his own bed? 
No, this is women's work. I'd have to do it. Mom explained it. He takes, he feeds the horses and does all that, and which was a lot less work than making, cleaning up his room and making his bed. I observed, but you know, I thought her mother was very um, well. Let's put it this way: I thought her mother was really different in her view and outlook on life. Um, I remember one time Kathy was having to do the beds, I guess, and mumbling about it, very mildly mumbling. And she, uh, and I think she said, uh, oh, fart. And her mother came unglued and turned to her and she said, what did you just say, Kathy said, she said, oh, fart. She says, there's nothing wrong with a damn or a hell, she says, but you never say fart. <laughs> I don't know why you never say fart. Um, well, it makes sense to me. Does it? But you don't. You know, but I thought it was so funny because um, my parents didn't swear at all. My dad always said, oh, shucks. And I remember after Watergate and Nixon debacle, where they had him, you know, doing all that swearing that they'd recorded him doing. And I, I remember asking my dad. I said, "Well, I understand you don't swear in front of the family, but do your friends talk like that when you're, you know, when there's not women around?" And he said, "Absolutely not. Or maybe they do or they don't, but he he was going to keep that." that myth going as long as possible, right? But I don't know, because I have to tell you, I never heard him swear. I couldn't tell you whether he did or he didn't, because I never heard it. Make sense? Yep. Never heard my daddy swear. He didn't either, huh? Nope. And now it's just pretty common, you know, I swear, everybody, you know. My good friend Liz Clark doesn't swear, but good for her. <laughs> I, you know, we we all do the best we can with what the within our limitations, and, and that's just saying anything one way or wrong about it or another. But a lot of little layering pieces in this painting. Yeah, it's looking pretty. It's coming coming along, right? Huh? It looks nice. Just so many little layers of paint. To... Just are. Lights and darks back in. So let's see, back to our, our friends. But Kathy Playsick was probably my in junior high. She, she we rode the bus together and we were good friends, and Eddie Murphy that lived up in one of the subdivisions, and he had a horse too. Kathy and I were friends because we both had horses. And, uh, and I liked her. And Eddie, my friend, my friend Eddie Murphy. I liked Eddie. We, we we thought at one point that we could be. We rode all horses all the time, and we were not. We tried once to, to get a stab at any kind of romantic something between us. We were such good friends. We just didn't have that vibe between us. 
but we were in junior high school together, and I'd go over to to his house, and uh, he lived in this, uh, they called it storybook homes. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that term. They were called storybook houses, and they were cracker boxes. And he kept his horse, oh, I don't know, just down the hill and, I don't know, 10 blocks away from where he lived. Pretty steep hill, too. But he would, uh, he would meet us, and we'd go riding, and we did horse shows together and stuff. And I remember at his, he was a very good pianist, and um, his, he had a practice. A lot of times he couldn't come out and play because he had a practice. And uh, his parents were very strict on that. But the funniest thing I remember about him was that he, uh, he, he was very dissatisfied with the tract house. It bugged him that he lived in a tract house. Okay? And he didn't like living there. So he was constantly trying to fi find, figure out ways to improve it. I don't know if he was embarrassed to buy the house or what the deal was, but he, he'd bring me over and he'd, he'd I remember him running the garden hose. You gotta pause it for a minute, John. I gotta blow my nose again. I'll dry this. Now, <laughs> you can't just start talking. Okay, good. So what Eddie, Eddie would do was he would take the garden hose and he would um, spray the house so that the paint looked darker. And he'd say things like, don't you think the house would look better if it was darker. And then I'd say, oh, sure. You know, cause, I mean, I didn't know whether his house looked better, darker, or light. I didn't care one way or the other. I really had no opinion about his house, right? But um, he made his parents repaint the house because it so upset him that they lived in a house that was the wrong color brown. I don't know. Um, yeah, huh? It seems a little. It was extreme. Well, it was believable, just a little odd. Well, I think, you know, that's, you know he, he had strong feelings about that man. Yeah. He didn't want to live in that um, house that had that... That kind of environment. That kind of environment, right? He just, that wasn't his, he just... And years later now, what happened to Eddie is really kind of... He became very successful. And uh, he ended up with a giant horse ranch and horses and stables and all that stuff. My sister, I never ran into him again, but my sister did. But okay, so we, I told you we did horse shows together. It had these Gymkhana things that were part of um, uh, them. You know, there was this Bridal Trail Straight Park up from us. And then at the end of it, they had the, the, the on in the summer and spring and stuff and the weekends, they had these Gymkhanas, which were for the horses and stuff. It wasn't was uh, run by the local somebody, right? I don't know who did, right? Somebody did. So we would go up and, and um, uh, we would go up and, um, and compete, okay? All of us, pole bending and whatever it was, we'd all go up there. And, and Eddie got himself a new horse. He, um, he, it was quite wonderful. It was, I was so happy for him. He got his, this, Beautiful new Appaloosa horse. 
And uh, those of you who don't know anything about Appaloosa horses, Appaloosa horses are not pintos, but they, um, the Indians rode them and they have those kind of spots on them. And, the, and the, the, what the cavalry did, because that would be like their tanks, right? If you think about it from that, from that standpoint, what the cavalry did was um, uh, breed their horses back to plow horses so they couldn't do raids. I mean, they couldn't take the horses away from them because that was life. But they, So at some point in the universe of happenings, the Appaloosa horses' um, pedigree got diluted. Yeah. So um, anyway, then they were allowed to breed them back to, um, to breed them back to, for a long time, for several years, um, to either quarter horses or Arabians. Um, and if you went to an Appaloosa show, um, you had, uh, uh, you were judged on the spots and their coloring because that, that's all they could judge you on, right? Was the coloring. So Eddie had taken this Gymkhana. He had entered his uh, horse in the, in the show and he decided that he didn't like just like his house right you got you know you got to understand it you got to remember his house okay so Eddie decided that uh, he didn't like the way the spots were on his horse okay and he thought they could be better so he took some shoe polish and he kind of you know kind of like a girl might enhance her hair he enhanced the um, the spots. <gasps> You're going, no way, he didn't. I said he did. So when he got into the, the show with the judge, when it came time, and she'd, what they do is they, if you've ever seen a horse show, they walk around your horse and they pat the rump and they look at all these things, right? And they looked at him and they said, son, what do you do when it rains? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the gig was up, right? <laughs> well, it's a good question. Uh, well, sure. Because what do you do if it rains? If um, Yeah, huh? What do you do? So anyway, he was... Um, I, I really enjoyed Eddie. I just thought he was a great guy. And... Uh, you know, and he he just, and he wasn't good. He wasn't deterred by his, the fact that he had to earn jobs to pay for his horses or any of that stuff. He was willing to do it all. Um, to, to whatever it took, right? Whatever it took. And and he was a great. I mean, you know, so he, he's not. I don't know what's happened to him since then. I haven't kept up with him. But as a friend, he was a great friend, and somebody I could count on to go riding with as long as he didn't have piano lessons. It was hard, to, you know, because I grew up. You know, when I grew up, wanting to ride and stuff and do stuff on weekends, there wasn't a gym con. It was hard to get these other people out of bed. They were. Um, they just you just couldn't motivate people to to move, you know what I'm saying? Honestly, John, to get anybody out to do anything. That was next to impossible. It was neat. And uh, I had one, one friend that, had, that I could ride horses with through some school and I could ride horses with her. But again, she, um, she partied, slept out late could not be relied upon. Nope, nope, nope. Could not be relied upon. And uh, I mean, I remember one time she had this house in this very upscale sub subdivision, not like Eddie's place, but with the cracker bot hot box houses, but. Um, she had this, I'm trying to think what her name was, but she invited everybody over to her house for a 
uh, just an evening with our boyfriends and stuff. And um, her mother did tarot readings and read all our read our uh, read our own palms. And she was so embarrassed by that. And I thought, it, I tell you what I thought. I thought it was so great that she had a mom that had the slightest interest in anybody that showed up at her house, <laughs> right? That you know, she's uh, she, she was all embarrassed by her mom, and I was. I was shocked. I thought her mom was really awesome. Gotta tell you. Uh, but you know, everybody sees their parents differently. I thought she had the nicest mother ever. You know, so. So I think we've kind of covered going from. Uh, windmills to burnt, you know, to tree houses to I'm going to need a new place to mix colors here. Let's see, do we have any white left? I guess got some here. Magenta. Interesting about layering skies, you got to do it at times when they're this, and this rock here up and then. I'm just kind of mumbling to myself now, trying to decide where I'm going to put all these colors, these final colors on the painting. And um, John, you might want to get ready to have a have a frame, you might say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barb likes this picture. Is she on by any chance? Who's that? What? Was, was Barb on by any chance no. today? No. So I haven't seen her. Oh, she's going to miss this. Well, she can watch it on the replay. Oh, absolutely. You can watch it on the replay. That was the other thing we didn't have on kids. When you missed a TV show, that was it, man. You didn't get to see it. If you missed it, then. Well, that, yeah, that, yeah. You right? missed it? Too bad. So yeah. sad. You just, you just never knew, right? Never knew. Let me go back and add some stuff. A lot of times you don't know 
what happens to your friends that you grow up with, you don't see them again. Some people, particularly if you move around a lot, you don't, don't keep in touch. Um, my first husband, Colby, he grew up in Mort Rollins, Wyoming, and his very best friend and him uh, learned, to, learned scuba diving together, and they, they had so many shared, I guess, uh, me memories, yes? And we had been on a competitive trail ride with the horses in Colorado, and we were sp spending the night at this place, and uh, it turned out that um, uh, his friend from high school, the one that he hadn't heard from in 30 years, was uh, working at that camp, this campsite. And uh, anyway, so they got together. They came over. It, it, it was all arranged. And he, he said, that name sounds familiar, and is that so-and-so, and all that stuff, right? So it's, it turned out the, uh, the two of them got together, and I never forget this, in our motorhome. And they were talking, and I just let them reminisce about old times. And honestly, John, it was the funniest thing ever. For about five minutes, all they said to each other was, oh my gosh, you're so old. <laughs> oh my God, you're so old. They, they must, <laughs> I just, seriously speaking, that's what they said that whole time. Oh my gosh, you're so old. There's a song about that, I think, isn't there? Maybe it's not so. Anyhow, the um, uh, I just thought that was funny. I'm sorry. It just I thought it was really funny that they. That's not what you want your friends to say to you at their first reunion. Is I think reunions maybe are a mistake. I've never gone back to any of my high school ones. Everybody was kind of mean to me in high school, so why would I want to go see them again? Right? Well, exactly. I mean, I didn't want to see him again. But, you know, so. Got to put, I hate to put more paint out at the end. You know, you just hate to do it. But sometimes I, I hate you just. To do that. But, you know, sometimes you just have to do it to and finish your painting. And that right? final touch. Yeah, you got to do it. Yeah, you're so old. That's what they said to each other the whole evening. Not how you've been doing, or you know, I mean, not even reminiscing just the slightest little bit. You would have thought there'd been some of that, right? There really other wasn't. Other than just hearing each other, oh, you're so old. Yeah, other than that, right? And there wasn't just. I don't know. People are funny. I think. I guess I could play with this all day, but I think I've pretty much captured Susan one Susan says, I love your seascapes. I painted one of yours 20 by 24 by 24 and sold it before I even got it hung on my wall. 
Oh wow, that's awesome. There we go. Ah, just knew I'd get it, right? Sometimes you just know, right? Well, yeah, just kind of work with it. It's all about layers. Yeah, it just is. It's all about, you know, layers and um, layers contrast and, and yeah. contrast and. The yin and the yang of it. Yeah. Just small things like not having straight lines, like coming in here and just put it cutting in a little bit into this rock with the just not having just just breaking up the shapes is 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 it kind of be key. Not get it too busy. All right, I'm liking that. I think I want the. I'm gonna put my birds in. Of course, you guys, you know I've got birds. Birds and no tractors just isn't right. I think flying tractors are in order. If you want to say a bird's farther away, you got to make it smaller. Okay. That's so. Oh, I like the colors in this wave, don't you? Yes. Let's find the frame for this. And uh, see what we got, John. All right. Let's see if we can find a frame. Nope, no frames. Nope, don't see one here either. How about over here? You thinking golden or brown? Oh, uh, I think gold. You yeah, always pick gold. gold. I think I'd put a gold frame with this. You think you would? You're sneezing because you opened the window. Just but, saying. So, yeah, I opened the window to cool it off because I was getting almost sick from the heat. Well, you're the one that's been complaining and been so cold. Yeah. Is it good? Yeah, let's, let's try it real quick, right? There, just here you go. Just a quick touch up. Yeah, just put it in the frame. I think Barb's going to be very happy with this. 
Yeah, we haven't done these sort of, you know, for those of you who are wondering, this is, I told everybody at the beginning, it's not a tutorial, but um, early in December, we sold a lot of... Uh, <laughs> um, More than we thought we would. Uh, painting renewals, there we go. Uh, you know, membership Perfect. renewals to our academy, and anybody that re meant that they, um, if they were a uh, purple member and they signed up for a year, they got a, a 9 by 12, right? No, 8 by 10? What was it? I've forgotten. We had 6 by 8, 8, 10, 9, 12, 12, 16. Yeah, two years was 9, 12. Okay. Anyway, Barb signed up for the two years, so she got the, this one painting. I'm going to use a small white um, pen to... That frame really sets it off, doesn't it? Oh, but the frame does, doesn't it? And when this is varnished, you guys, it will be pretty, pretty terrific too. But I love the the colors, you know, seeing through the wave like this. And uh, but if you want to learn to paint water, and you really want to, you know, want to. Um, a little brighter, then I will suggest a um, wave, you know, take our um, wave and water classes and, and see if your water skills don't uh, uh, exponentially expand and uh, you might be very thrilled with what you end up painting. So I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this uh, story time this week and um, we'll see you all next time. And I tell you what, I'd ask very sincerely if you wouldn't mind leaving the um, um, your comments, okay, because that makes a difference to us, and, um, you know, and it can it be very, very that. helpful, right? Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll probably be here more than likely tomorrow. And have a wonderful day and stay dry out there for those that are experiencing the wetness. Bye, everyone. Yep, bye.